So hi, friends. Welcome, everybody, online and in the center. Just so you know, Ryan, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine of us or 10 here. You might not be able to see everybody, but um, it was announced that you were online, so it's fewer than normal. But we're thrilled that you're here. And I'm Mace. I'm one of the volunteers. And I'm delighted to invite uh, Ryan to be our guest teacher tonight. And the way I know Ryan is by taking a year-long course with him and Eve Ekman, our normal teacher for the night in cultivating emotional balance. So what I know about Ryan without Lee reading his bio is that he's a wonderful, kind, excellent human being, I believe who lives in Idaho. Yes. Yes. And starting a cool nonprofit um, that does like social emotional learning and mindfulness in schools and um, studies, correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay, excellent has studied extensively with Alan Wallace. And um, what I remember most from cultivating emotional balance is that you continually encourage us to harvest joy oh. in our practice and our life. And I wanted to make it a bumper sticker. Um, and really just mostly he's a delightful, excellent kick-ass human being. And we're really happy to have you tonight. Beautiful. Thank you, Mace. Thank you for the, yeah. um, the warm introduction and yeah, I wish I could see, I can see folks in the studio. Um, I'm delighted to be here. I, I recognize a few faces here online. And what I wanted to do actually to start for the evening was give us a moment to really settle in. I'm not sure where everyone is coming from. I am coming from my house with two teenage boys full of testosterone. So I always appreciate entering into a kind of bardo experience, a transition into the Dharma collective energy. So um, selfishly, giving myself a few moments to arrive will be great. But also as we go into this practice, I and it's just gonna be a few minutes and then we'll kind of launch into a topic that Eve encourage me to explore with you this evening. But before we do that, I want to bring in this idea that comes into a Buddhist context for sure, but I think it also comes up in our everyday life, maybe not in this exact way, the, the term I'm about to use, but it's something that I would like us to check in with as we, we center ourselves this evening, and that is where do we find refuge in our life? So many of you who are Buddhists, you may have a daily practice of going for refuge. And a, a classic refuge liturgy or prayer is, may I go for refuge in the, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. And so for some of you, a variation of that can be very meaningful for orienting ourselves back to what feels most meaningful and purposeful to us, but also it supports us as an anchor, as the name suggests, when there's just chaos around us, where do we turn? What is our refuge? And I, I would suggest, as I, I mentioned earlier, that many of us are, are doing this all of the time. When something comes up, where do I go for refuge? And I know for myself on, on certain occasions, it's I go for refuge in non-dairy coconut bliss, you know, and sometimes that, that works out, at least in the short term. And if I continue indulging, then I realize, you know, that's not a true source of refuge in terms of supporting my long-term well-being. So tonight, I want to frame our conversation with this idea of refuge and then go into the practice of mindfulness of mind eventually and see if we can break that down a little bit and maybe bring some subtle nuance to the practice that some of you may have explored, some of you might be brand new to, and then we'll see if we can open it up for some time for discussion, people's insights and, and commentary. I know this is a well-seasoned group, and of course, you're in amazing hands with, with I, I like to refer to Eve as Dr. Ekman Jr., um, but Eve is such a wonderful teacher and I personally have benefited a lot from Eve's teachings myself and, and always delight in the opportunity that we, we have to teach together. So with that being said, let's go ahead and we'll give ourselves 
just a few minutes to really settle in to whatever space we're finding ourselves in this evening. And if it supports you in this process of settling to close the eyes, feel free to do so. Otherwise you can keep your eyes open and relax the eyes. And to initiate a deeper kind of settling, bring awareness to any parts of the body that are being supported right now, supported by a chair, the floor, a cushion. And with these points of contact of support, Tune into the experience of being held. And if we can move into this visceral experience of being held quite naturally, we might feel inspired to release any of our own holding. And to further encourage this release of holding or gripping or tightening, It may be useful to rely upon the breath and seize the opportunity to let go with each out breath. And quite possibly the weight of the body becomes more pronounced against whatever's supporting the body. And within this momentary experience of grounding, consider for yourself, where are some of the places you go for refuge? What is a reliable support that can hold us, not only physically, but mentally, emotionally, and spiritually? And if a clear orientation of refuge has arisen for you, acknowledge that with awareness. And with this acknowledgement, can you allow this 
confidence and connection to your source of refuge, to appreciate, to grow. with this connection to our own sense of refuge, to the support that is holding the weight of the body, I invite you to begin to reorient to our collective space, both in person and virtually. And if your eyes have been closed, you can Slowly blink them open. All right. So tonight I thought it would be interesting to, to frame our exploration with this connection or reflection on refuge. Because as I mentioned, I think there, there are so many things in, in just Buddhist practice alone that we can focus on. And I think it's, as I mentioned earlier, very valuable to, to focus on the relationship maybe one has with the teachings of the historical Buddha, the many communities that have formed historically around that. But I also think it's very helpful to really get specific and see what are the things that we can apply immediately to our experience that really give us an orientation with our experience that we can rely upon that minimizes or diminishes or attenuates the experience of suffering. And of course, the, the Buddhist path is, is very interested in suffering and I think we don't necessarily have to be Buddhist to be interested in suffering. I, I know most people, when they experience any sort of pain, it, it catches our attention. And our natural response is to, to find a solution, to find our way out. And so one of the things that I know Eve mentioned to me as, as I was briefly messaging, messaging her back and forth about what you guys had been exploring that really rose to the surface that I wanted to build on tonight that she had mentioned uh, this, this technique or this experience really that she referred to as stillness and motion. And so for many of you that are new, maybe you weren't at Eve's talk last week or when she presented this, this idea within the context of mindfulness of mind. Stillness in motion is a, is a shorthand description to describe a particular state of being where one in relationship specifically to the mind, but it could be broadened eventually to all contents of our experience, where one is very aware of the arising and passing of different phenomena. In particular, again, going back to the mind, we can use the word mental events to encompass many things, such as thoughts, desires, emotions, anticipations, mental images, memories, 
So the entire constellation of mental events that we can experience in this context, we refer to that as motion, as something that we can directly perceive through mental perception. And so mental perception kind of sounds like, I know a little bit, almost like the, the twilight zone, or it's, it, it's not a term that's, that's often used, but it's exactly that. It's in the same way we can visually understand our experience through the eyes, mentally, in real time, we can gain tremendous insight and knowledge about what's happening in our mind. So often when people talk about um, metacognition is a word that comes up. It's a fancy word that's used in psychology. And they often talk about metacognition as thinking about thinking. And this is actually different than thinking about thinking. It's being able to observe. So we're not thinking about the thoughts we're having, but we're actually developing this capacity as thoughts arise or, and I'm using thoughts again, interchangeably with mental events, but as the entire array of mental events arise, we have a capacity to observe them and watch them come and go. And so that's this motion part. And the stillness is the subjective experience of that. And particularly, the stillness is pointing to the experience of being aware. And simultaneously, as we're watching whatever's coming to mind, there's an awareness of being aware. And the idea with what I, th I think Eve presented, and, and she told me that many of you had the opportunity to practice, is through practice, we start to develop a capacity where we can rest in the stillness of awareness amidst the movements of the mind. And as a refuge for people in real time, there's thousands of years of experience. So going back to when the Satipatthana Sutta was presented during the time of the Buddha, so maybe somewhere around 2,500 years ago, it was recognized that, of course, when we look at suffering on the surface, it looks like the causes of suffering are out there. Someone does something to us and then it feels bad. And so they made us feel bad. But the Buddha's great discovery was that actually our suffering is coming from how we're relating to our experience, the states of mind that are filtering our experience, then make us vulnerable to the experience of suffering. And so very early on, there was a, an impetus or a push, an inspiration to see, is it possible to step out of the contents of experience in our mind and observe them from a place of being aware and let them just naturally come and go. So if something magnificent arises, we observe its magnificence, but we're not becoming fused with it. If something malevolent or hostile comes to mind, can we observe the experience of hostility without becoming hostile? Can we observe the experience or the impulse for malevolence without becoming malevolence, keeping this, this distance away from what's coming to mind. So this has been something that's been explored for a long time, as I mentioned earlier. But then I know, I think maybe 20, 30 years ago, I want to say in the, the 90s, so just, just about 20 years ago, there was, there was some work done with applying this to different mental health disorders. And so in the, in the clinical psychology and some of the researchers, John Teasdale, um, Zindel Siegel, 
couple that really kind of led the charge in this way, we're finding that when people actually develop this skill of being able to watch the contents of their experience of their mind without getting caught up in it, it became in certain situations as effective as whatever the treatment as usual would be for recurrent depression, anxiety. So it was giving people an internal frame of reference where they had space to observe things that were coming to mind, but they weren't, they were observing anxiety, but without becoming anxious. They were observing the mental states associated with depression, things like despair, hopelessness, but without becoming those things. And so it's a very well-researched practice coming in from, from the door of, of Western psychology. And so I know you guys focused on that last week. And this week, what I would like to do is push the practice of mindfulness of the mind a bit further. And so how I want to approach this is, is first go back to the Buddha's presentation on mindfulness of mind to see what, what is it? What's the invitation to do here? And we're just going to take a part of it because it's, it's a fairly extensive practice. And some of the things that are mentioned in the Satipatthana Sutta in terms of how one is relating to different experiences of the mind are initially more rarefied states of mind, states of mind that come through, through very deep and prolonged meditation. But there are some mental states right away that the Buddha referred to as these are ordinary states. And learn to identify these because if we can identify these, we're really starting to get very close to the root of our suffering. And so what I wanted to do first is just to define a little bit what these mental states are, and then we can build from there. And then I really want to bring in a, a subtle piece in practice that will deepen this experience of stillness and motion. So in the Satipatthana Sutta, and I, I'm actually, I should have had the the actual discourse right in front of me. So I'm going to be pulling or paraphrasing the, the sutta itself. The Buddha, he, he invites, he invites the meditators. He, he's actually in the sutta, he's addressing monks and he, he encourages the monks in practicing mindfulness of the mind to recognize first when attachment arises in the mind, recognize the presence of attachment. And when non-attachment is in the mind, recognize the experience of non-attachment. So this is the first ordinary state that he identifies in this practice of mindfulness of mind. And then he goes on to say, when hostility or sometimes it's translated as afflictive aversion arises in the mind, recognize the presence of afflictive aversion. And when there's an absence of afflictive aversion, recognize the absence of afflictive aversion. And then he goes on to follow the same refrain with ignorance, or sometimes people refer to this as delusion. And then he adds two more that I think we can bring into our practice tonight recognizing when the mind becomes contracted and when the mind is free from contraction. And in this context, contraction just means dullness or when the mind becomes heavy or spaced out. And then finally, of these ordinary mental states, he says, it's very important to recognize when the mind becomes distracted and when there's an absence of distraction. So he gives us a internal framework within all the many things that we can know in the mind, he says he really emphasizes these five ordinary mental states. And I think the word ordinary is very comforting because 
if he didn't use the word ordinary, when we started looking in our mind, we might really feel like, gosh, I'm really screwed up. But the word ordinary, it really points to the fact that these, by and large, are pretty ubiquitous amongst all of us. They're very commonplace. So we shouldn't, on first glance, when we start to really probe the mind and see, gosh, are any of these actually present? And then we find, God, not only are they present, they seem like they're persistent. They're there all the time. He says, don't worry. These are, these are ordinary mental states. And so he really sets out this internal framework in this practice to graduate not only from just being able to observe the mind from this place of stillness, but to add this level of discernment so that when we see motion, can we clearly recognize or identify any one of these five mental states? And the reason is that of these five, if we were to look at any sort of other destructive mental state, it said that all are derivative from one of these five, or even we can, we can synthesize it down to three, which many of you may have received teachings about the three poisons, which we could say ignorance, attachment, and afflictive aversion. And if we can really get some clarity about when are these present, when are they absent, then we're able to move into a much deeper dimension of refuge where we're not finding a way to establish an internal frame of reference with our minds so that whatever comes up, we can watch without grasping. But we're starting to shift more to seeing, can I watch for the specific things that really elicit my suffering? And can I get really clear with the underlying conditions that allow me to become free from my suffering? And that's what the absence is referring to. So it's not just referring to there's no attachment, but the absence in this context is contentment in place of attachment. Afflictive aversion, we talk about the absence of afflictive aversion is when there's a presence of love or deep kind of existential appreciation. And with ignorance, the absence or the, what is sometimes called in the, in the sutta itself, non-ignorance is really apprehending or experiencing this unique way of being where we're no longer grasping onto a kind of separate individual sense of self. And this is where I think there's an incredible opportunity to bring some nuance into the practice, particularly around this idea of non-ignorance and framing our practice from the get-go as best we can with a, at least a sensibility of what non-ignorance non may be like and then watching the mind from that place and allowing that to be our baseline as we come into this experience of stillness in motion when we're talking about this practice of mindfulness of the mind. And ordinarily, if we don't question this, the Buddhist assertion is pertaining to ignorance, that ignorance is a conate mental affliction. So the hypothesis is we're born with it. So it's very hard then to recognize it because it's always been with us as far as we've, we've been embodied in this, this form. And so it's hard to step out of it, but once we step out of it, we can see, oh, wow, this is an entirely different experience altogether. And I was thinking of a, a metaphor for this. As Mace mentioned, I live up in Idaho and 
my wife and I often go backpacking. So we have lots of different mountain ranges here. And one of our, our great treats, I mentioned I have teenage boys, is to grab backpacks and go head out into the wilderness for a few days. And for those of you, I don't know if, if anyone on the call has ever gone backpacking in the backcountry, but one of the things that you do when you're backpacking is you just eat very simply. You know, it's you, you don't want to lug up a bunch of heavy food and have it be complicated and all of that. So a lot of the backpacking food is like dehydrated beans and rice and things that you just add hot water to. And it, it makes it very simple to eat back there and, and not have to fuss with, with creating a fancy meal. And one of the things that we often bring, my wife and I, is we, we bring a red, red beans and rice recipe. And although it's delicious, one of the things about red beans and rice, and, and some of you maybe have this problem too, and you could relate to this, is that we get pretty gassy after we eat it. And so then we end up going into our tent at night <laughs> and we were hunkering down in our tent and, you know, we, we can kind of hear each other, we're sleeping, but all of a sudden this, this gas cloud fills the tent and very quickly we kind of become normalized to our own red beans and rice aftermath stench that fills the, fills the tent. And it's not until in the middle of the night, say we have to get up and go to the bathroom that you unzip the tent and you walk out and you go out and then you're kind of in the clean mountain air again. Right. Then you're outside and you're like, wow, it's, it's you know, so crisp and so beautiful. And then you come back into the tent and then you realize like, whoa, I've been sleeping in this. This is, you know, I'm surprised we're even alive, you know, not if, uh, uh, I think it's called asphyxiated from our own from our own gas. So ignorance is kind of like that. Until we step out of it, we don't even really know we're in it. So then when the Buddha is giving this invitation, you know, then we're we're given this invitation of, hey, recognize when ignorance is present and recognize when ignorance is not present. We don't really have a baseline if all we know, our orientation and meditation practice is, I'm sitting down to meditate. I'm going to do mindfulness of, of the mind. I'm going to practice this. I'm going to go for refuge. And our orientation is always this solidified sense of self. Then we were suffering from that kind of asphyxiation of of this kind of gas cloud of ignorance in our mind. And it just becomes so normalized that we don't really have any way to step out of it. And what's interesting, insofar as that ignorance is intact, and, and here's the Buddhist hypothesis that we're invited to put to the test of our experience, that insofar as we're grasping onto an aspect of our body, our feelings, our mind, which you've already been exposed to in the prior applications of mindfulness, looking at the body as, as the body and looking at feelings as feelings. But insofar as we're, we're holding on to any of that or even the intention that we have, I'm meditating, then there's always going to be this experience of dukkha, this kind of resistance, this this uneasiness, this underlying level of suffering. And insofar as that's in place and we're not aware of it, we're kind of living in that, that tent of ignorance, if you will, then our natural inclination, if we're not aware of that, our refuge is gonna be, what can I get to make myself feel better? What can take the edge off that existential kind of gripping? or grasping. And so then we see this profound interrelationship as we start to investigate the mind, we see when ignorance is present, then attachment, it arises soon after. And then we start to see this attachment is there. And then the, maybe there's a longing for this or a longing for that. 
And then over time, we can start to see that that attachment is then connected to a kind of afflictive aversion. And its connection is made in, even if I get something on the outside that takes the edge off, over time, it changes. We can't hold on to it. Or maybe that what I really want to get, I don't get. And so either way, if I don't get it, or I do get it, and it changes, over time, we start to become disappointed by our experience. And then there's a kind of a pernicious cynicism that kind of creeps in, where it's kind of like, oh, man. Life is just hard. Life sucks. And this is when this afflictive aversion is very present. And so it's very hard to have this deep sense of appreciation, this gratitude or love when that state is present. But all of it hinges upon our ignorance and our ability to recognize when is this ignorance present and when is it absent. But if we're entering the practice, even going into stillness of mo in motion, and we have this implicit sense that I'm aware and I'm obser observing the mental events in my mind, I'm resting in that tent of this ignorant stench of self-grasping. So what's indispensable in this practice of mindfulness of mind is working toward a baseline level of awareness where our mind is not configured by this ignorance. And this is what really strongly differentiates the practice of what we call Vipassana or clear seeing this investigation practice, which Vipassana always entails some level of inquiry, discernment, even if it's just simply recognizing these mental states when they're present and absent. But it's also could be a discernment or an insight into a deeper dimension or experience of reality. So it's not just calming the mind, resting in a quiet place, but there's always some level of discernment happening in the practice. And so we're inviting that in from the get-go as we slip in to this framework of resting in stillness, the stillness of our awareness. And even as I'm describing it, I'm saying the stillness of our awareness, I'm reinforcing that ignorance with this idea of, oh yeah, there's a possessor here of that awareness and that's me. And so as we go into our practice tonight, to kind of create this baseline, to look into identifying some of these, these different mental states of one, when is ignorance present? When is it absent? Two, when is attachment present? When is it absent? And in this case, attachment is just referring to this, this kind of craving or longing for something outside of ourselves to bring us lasting satisfaction. So it becomes a kind of worldview or an orientation that we're bringing out, looking for what thing, what person, what job, what place, what will make me truly happy. And so this, this ignorance, can we recognize when that kind of clinching, that that craving sets in? And can we recognize when is it absent? Are there moments when it falls away and we slip into a place of deep contentment? And then finally, the last, the last three, again, can we recognize this presence and absence of afflictive aversion? The absence of it is not just simply we're not feeling hostile, but it's this more positive affirmation of when do we actually feel a kind of existential or inherent sense of appreciation of 
of love, of warmth. And then the last two, looking for when the mind becomes dull, lethargic, or distracted, and looking at when is the mind clear, present, and when is the mind steady and focused. So what I want to do is see, can we bring that together in a practice, exploring mindfulness of the mind as, as presented by, by the Buddha, and specifically, right out of the gate, see, can we begin to establish this baseline of non-ignorance by going into this place of exploring stillness and motion, but by investigating who's there that's still? Is this awareness a person? Is it me? When I say I'm aware, where's that I that's aware? And we start to investigate that. And through that investigation, can we maybe slip in to a baseline of observing our mind outside the tent, observing the mind from this much larger space where we're not already configured by one of these ordinary mental states. And if that's the case, if we can start to even just get a taste of that, then we can really closely follow the Buddha's instruction. We can see almost in real time when that seizure of self-grasping sets in and we begin to clinch and tighten and we can recognize, ah, ignorance is present. And maybe we observe that and we can come back to that baseline of being aware, but not aware with that reified or that, that tightened sense of self, but come back to that baseline of being aware, but being aware without any sort of configuration. So we'll give it a, a shot to see if we can explore that in our own minds. And then I would love to, to open it up for, for a much broader discussion and any comments or questions, insights that people might have. So let's go into the practice first. We'll try it on and then we'll go from there. So if you would like, if you're online with us in the world of Zoom, if you would like, you can even turn off your camera and just rely on the support of the audio experience. But again, most importantly, see if you can Give yourself a moment to settle into a comfortable position. And this may mean that you keep the eyes open with an initial orientation of the space around you. For some of us, maybe closing the eyes is a comfortable place to be. And then let's gradually begin to establish this experience of stillness and motion by first becoming aware of the immediate experience of the body. And specifically begin to notice the different sensations and feelings that are present.
and while acknowledging the sensations and feelings throughout the body. Explore the stillness of awareness, that which knows sensation and feeling. And without tightening, is it possible to rest momentarily in the stillness of awareness amidst the movements of sensation and feeling within the body? <laughs> if, if you guys wouldn't mind, we can hear you. So we're just in our presentation practice. So if you wouldn't mind muting your microphone, that would be awesome. And again, for those of you that have established this point of reference of resting in the stillness of awareness amidst the movements of sensation and feeling in the body. Check in if there's any tightness or contraction. in establishing this experience. And if so, can you give yourself permission to relax and release? Perhaps deepening the sense of relaxation with each out breath. And now let's shift to a subtler domain of, the, of our lived experience, the domain of the mind. And if you're not familiar with shifting your perception to the mind itself, sometimes it's helpful to deliberately generate a thought or a mental image. So you could bring to mind the image of a glass of water, or even the thought, water. And as you bring such an image to mind, Observe where that image appears in the space of the mind. And then allow that image or thought to naturally dissipate while continuing to be vividly aware, present.
And in this way, begin to focus attention on this domain of the mind and all that arises within it. And as we did earlier with the body, then you acknowledge the stillness of awareness, that which knows the mind, and the movements of the mind happening simultaneously. And sometimes or frequently we may lose that sense of being aware and we may slip into the contents of the mind altogether. So we're no longer observing, but we're caught up and carried away in a story, a chain of thought, an experience of emotion. In which case, can you relax? and reestablish the experience of being aware, of knowing. And resting in the stillness of that knowing, again, amidst the motion of the mind. And now momentarily, let's emphasize the experience of being aware. And experientially, as we come to this sense of knowing, Can you detect a sense of identity of self, of there being someone who's here who's knowing? and investigate what is it that is here that is knowing? What are the qualities of the I, or the one who's resting in the stillness of awareness?
And other than these qualities being just expressions of the mind itself, can they be found anywhere in awareness? In other words, is there any I to be found in the experience of being aware? Let's give ourselves a minute or two to continue exploring this. Who is aware? Is there any I to be found in awareness itself? And maybe through this investigation, we start to reveal a kind of spaciousness, a presence of being. Unencumbered by any cloak of identity. And if we experience this spaciousness, can you rest in this spacious awareness? resting in stillness. And from here, activating a quality of discernment to recognize when does this spaciousness contract? When is there a sense of me doing the practice or I who's aware? And when is there freedom from that contraction? Can we distinguish the presence and absence of ignorance. And also emerging in this space, 
Can we begin to also sense when a eternal longing towards something more, a kind of persistent needing or wanting or something to gratify ourselves arises. The experience of attachment, wanting to consume And alternatively, can we recognize maybe on occasion that there are spontaneous moments of deep contentment, contentment not from getting something, but a contentment emerging from the experience of being. And often following an experience of attachment, there may be a kind of angst or frustration that begins to build, not getting what we want. Maybe the anticipation of losing what we have. And a kind of aversion emerges, a kind of resistance to reality, resistance to the unfolding of our life experience. This becomes more pronounced, it may emerge as a kind of hostility even. Or alternatively, we may find ourselves slipping into a spontaneous experience of gratitude or love, the absence of aversion, hostility. And occasionally it may be helpful to reinstate that question. Who is it that is aware? Reestablishing that baseline. Openness, spaciousness. Of unconfigured being. And finally, the last area for discernment is, can we recognize if the mind becomes contracted, dull, heavy, or the absence of contraction, clarity, vividness, and wakefulness? And can we discern presence of distraction or the absence of distraction, steadiness of focus. In this way,
becoming mindful of the mind. And all of this recognized on the foundation of stillness and motion. And so here, our refuge is not simply letting the experiences of the mind come and go. Our refuge becomes shifting our view, viewing from a ground of awareness that is unconfigured by self-grasping. And let's go ahead and we'll bring our reflection to a close. Give yourself a few minutes or a minute or so if you'd like to stretch out. Orienting yourself with the space. And then we slowly come back. All right. I'm not sure about what. Eve led last week, if she brought in these ordinary states, so that might have felt like, gosh, there was a, a lot to, to consider and explore upon the initial idea of stillness and motion. But I wonder, yeah, if folks want to share anything that you experienced or any thoughts or reflections you might have. And open us up for a, a group discussion. And I can't see if someone's raising their hand. So I, if you want to share or offer something, I think it's probably safe just to unmute yourself and jump right in. I'll, I'll just be here with my, my listening ears to see what, what comes.
Right, not a lot. Uh, I I have uh, something to share. Okay. That was so lovely. And you dovetailed with what Eve did last week beautifully. And it made me so grateful for the fact that I cultivate a practice of gratitude. Mm. And it just reminded me that we have so much more agency than we give ourselves credit for. Mm. That, you know, there's this fixation of control. And I think of control as kind of a uh, a false prize mm -hmm. but really uh, it's it's about choice mm -hmm. we we have so much power of and in choice and making mindfulness, it, it's lovely as a practice to come to the cushion like this and dedicate to practice. But mm -hmm. then how do we take it off the cushion and be aware of in our everyday just comings and goings to be aware, oh, I'm spacing out. Oh, I'm tripping on this oh, I'm pursuing something uh, <clears throat> outside of myself when really what I need to come back to is the, the greatest happiness that I'm ever going to enjoy is enjoying myself. Not meaning I'm going to enjoy myself when I go see the new Barbie movie. It's like, no, enjoy who you are as a person. Mm. Mm. Who... Who's speaking right now? Just so I can acknowledge your your name. I, I couldn't see. I tried to flip through the gallery view, but I couldn't see who was sharing. Oh, my name is Chris. Chris. Okay, thanks, Chris. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you for the reflection. And yeah, so so much you shared. And I wondered as we were going into the practice and you had this, this, this beautiful insight at the end of like, gosh, we, we can really just enjoy ourselves. What was it like to explore and look around for yourself in this inquiry and just check that out of like, you know, I'm, I'm the one who's making the choice. I'm the, I'm the one who's deciding I want to practice or I'm the one who wants to cultivate gratitude what kind of experience came up for you when you were exploring that? Huh. It got me, you know, deeply in touch with, uh, you know, kind of what a nut job I am, <laughs> how, uh, how uh, I am, as much as I enjoy my practice, uh, I still have a lot of work to do. <laughs> yeah. but 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 it's it's the good work and just I don't I don't have to judge myself I don't have to judge you know uh my um my aversions and my attractions I just have to be aware of them and are they serving me are they bringing me closer to uh, the self that I enjoy and the people that I love, or are they taking me out of that? Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And I think, you know, that's, that's like a, a, a huge step in this practice of just even recognizing like what are, when my attachments or my aversions are arising, what, what's my experience? How does that play into my experience? So we're starting to develop this kind of internal 
check in with ourselves as if we were like driving down the road and occasionally we're looking on the dashboard and you know my am, am i going over the speed limit how's my oil doing what's what are my what's my tire pressure like and so we're starting to kind of see these things that are happening internally that can often really just get in the way of showing up as our best selves so i think um you know that that insight very much aligns certainly with my experience as well of just having this internal processing system to be like, gosh, maybe I'm not going to go into this conversation right now. You know, my mind is really caught up in hostility or I'm not coming from, you know, my, my most wholesome intentions. I'm really kind of hankering with some attachment of, gosh, I really want this person to praise me and like me in a certain way. And so it's blocking my, my capacity to show up in a more wholehearted way to establish a more authentic connection. So thanks for sharing that, Chris. Appreciate that. Any other thoughts or insights that emerged from the practice? Was anyone else able to kind of, I don't know if I articulated it well in the beginning. Um, you know, in Idaho right now, it's nine o'clock. I'm a, I go to bed really early. So when I signed up for Eve, I was like, man, who knows what's going to come out, but this idea of like kind of getting in the tent, you know, and maybe it's a kind of a gross metaphor, but I couldn't really think of anything else, but maybe some of you experience that you don't have to go to a tent. Maybe it's just your bedroom, you know, and you, you're like lactose intolerant. You have a night where you're, like, oh, you know, and your partner knows, but then when you step out and you come back in, you're like, gosh, we got to crack the windows open and burn some incense in here. But were people able to step out of that, that, um, that ignorance that's being referred to here, that ignoring this deeper dimension of being that is not configured by self-grasping to kind of break through and, and really feel this kind of the stillness of awareness, but rooted in a very spacious kind of presence, not a stillness of I'm still watching the movements of my mind. I'm curious if any anybody tuned into that experience at all. And if, if so, what was that like? Yes, hello. Here is Isabella. Uh, this is was the first time that I actually felt like a centeredness as my eye when I was asking what was the eye. Um, and in a, during a moment of my practice, I kept saying in my mind, I, 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 like, like it was a beacon emitting this signal mm -hmm. and I could feel the centeredness and, but of course there were thoughts and I could see the movement of my awareness leaving and following those thoughts. And then I would come back so it was a very, very cool experience. And I, and I started to get excited about that. And that was a distraction in itself. Um, and then I, I was wondering, and then I started asking, does this feel peaceful? Or do I feel love? Do I feel gratitude? Uh, and for a moment, I couldn't feel anything. I, I think I was experiencing curiosity. Uh, but then towards the end, as I settled in, I could feel like this very sweet sensation of just being there. Um, so yeah, it was incredible to get to know that space because I think it will help to, to go back to it. So thank you so much. It was incredible. Thank you, Isabella. Yeah. And yeah, thank you. Thank you for opening that part of yourself up and coming to that centeredness and um, yeah, your willingness to explore. Yeah, I think the beauty is the, is the power is, is, is in asking that question, is in the inquiry itself, the um, real intimate inquiry of who's here, who's the meditator? And it really feels like the most likely suspect would be awareness. 
it seems pretty consistent, like the knower, the knowing behind the knowing, but is that a me? And what is it like when we kind of release that? And yeah, how does that open things up differently in the meditation? Any other thoughts, insights, or? Um, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, so uh, my name's Leif, and uh, I really like the tent metaphor. Uh, I find it to be very vivid and memorable, which is, which is really helpful. And uh, I came in today very much in the tent, uh, and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I think for me, what was what was valuable was just not necessarily that I was, you know, clearly outside of the tent and had some sort of, you know, clear awareness, but just sort of awareness that I that I have been in the tent or sort of awareness that that's not necessarily the uh, the only place to be in. And so I think I'm not I don't necessarily feel like I'm sort of walking out, you know, clear of the tent, but I think sort of having more perspective on where my mind is and, and where it could be um, is just really valuable um, to kind of feel like that's not the only way I could be. Yeah. 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 Thanks, Leaf. And that's like finding the zipper, you know, you, <laughs> if you, now, you know, there's a zipper to get outside the tent. Yeah. And, um yeah i think it's it's a a very profound beginning because we can often spend years meditating and we can be meditating in the tent itself you know and so the the beauty of mindfulness of mind just the question of recognizing when is ignorance present when is it absent implies that there's moments where we're stepping out of the tent but if we're never outside the tent it's really hard to say gosh i don't know you know i'm i'm we're kind of living in that space but to see what would it be like to kind of unzip the door and maybe even peek my head out for a moment and then we feel like boy i just got pulled back in i can feel that oh that's when ignorance is present i can feel that really strong sense of like wait what am i doing here what am i supposed to be observing and there's that that initial contraction that orientation where we lose that spacious presence of being but i think i think it's beautiful like you said whether you know we're inside or outside the tent just knowing there's a tent there something that's creating that separation from that more spacious kind of clear awareness Hi, this is yeah, Kimberly. Uh, oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, um, I went to a workshop last weekend on the right brain and getting in touch with your right brain. Mm -hmm. um, and we used our left hands to do things. And then yesterday I found myself, I, I needed to type something and I didn't remember what it was. And I found my left hand just typing something. And I looked at it and I thought, I don't know if that's right or not, but I tried it and it was right. And what's making me think of like how many of my thoughts can i not hear hmm. like what's going on that i don't know but could come out some other way mm -hmm. yeah 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 and this is where this practice even just this practice of you know, being able to observe your mind and we kind of start to to deepen that practice of just observing our mind, resting in the stillness of awareness, and we don't even bring the inquiry in, that after some time, what ends up happening in the practice, which I think is quite interesting, is initially we might come in and there could be many thoughts. And then over time, there's not as many thoughts, they become less frequent, and it would be really easy to space out. But an element of the practice that gets quite interesting is to space in like go deeper into the space. And we actually start to pick up this whole layer of thinking that would ordinarily be below our threshold of awareness. 
And so then we start to make what we could say the subconscious more conscious. And that can be a really interesting aspect of this practice of just starting to pick up thoughts that maybe we, we, we couldn't even pick up before, you know, just because we weren't, we weren't watching, we weren't attending to the mind as closely. But an interesting inquiry, you know, what, how much is happening kind of automatically. And um, that's, I think, goes back to this idea of ignorance is really just conate. It's happening all the time, but we don't even really recognize it. Someone else was going to. Um, yeah, I, this, I'll be quick. Um, I, I, I really, this is Ted. Um, I, I, I really <laughs> resonated with the tent um, metaphor, so I like it. But and I know, make a terrible pun here, but maybe you could call it the Fart Sutra. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I love it. There's always room for we. You know, we don't have to be stuck with just the, the original sutras. It can be a, a in-depth commentary. <laughs> Anything else from the Fart Sutra? Yeah. I mean, it, it smelled okay. I, I was in the corner up front holding the desk down, but uh, this is Brendan. I, uh, I, uh, yeah, the, I was like having some kind of spaciousness in the beginning and, and then noticing kind of pain and a certain contraction around that. That was, you know, it was kind of fine. It was like, right, it makes sense, you know, tending to the body. Um, but uh but yeah, those moments of like, well, you know, it's just, it's just what is happening is, is my mind in this moment. And then when I would get lost in thought, it, uh, it's just kind of, I could sort of feel like, cause there was so much contraction around the thoughts and the planning and, and there was like a built in like expectation, like you better pay attention to this cause you're going to fuck it up or it's extra important. You know, people's feelings are on the line was sort of, you know, it felt like it was like the pressure that made thought the only thing happening that I was aware of and everything else kind of going to the background rather than, you know, there's just things happening in consciousness. And so it, it, it kind of pointed. And then I think you started talking about the self and things like that. And where is it? And it was, uh, yeah, it was just really interesting and kind of a deeper experience of like you know the beliefs of the self or you know how it how it is so compelling because it's you know it, it raises the stakes and uh you know you're not thinking oh i might screw this up but that's like it's like sort of that's why the thoughts are were so compelling in the moment even though they were you know just sort of planning thoughts so anyways it was very very cool thank you brendan Well, it is 8.30, and I think it might be nice to give ourselves a moment to dedicate the, the time we've spent together, and I would love to just create space for, for folks to just pause for a minute or so to bring forth your own dedication, really follow your own intuition of as we move forward, how might this practice of mindfulness of the mind inspire us to approach ourselves, our relationship with others differently, and hopefully inspire a greater sense of well-being. So with that, we'll just close sitting for a minute in silence, engaging in a dedication that feels authentic and meaningful for you.
All right, y'all. Thank you so much for coming. Have a wonderful evening. Avoid red beans and rice if you're camping. And <laughs> hopefully you'll continue to explore this, this beautiful practice of mindfulness of the mind.